Bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Bienvenidas y bienvenidas al programa regional de capacitación para América Latina y la Caribe 2022. Um, aspectos clave para el avance de la movilidad eléctrica en la región, región en, uh, en el uh, que abordaremos los temas de infraestructura de recarga. El modelo 3, que está iniciando uh, en este momento, ahora. Uh, y uh, después de, de buses eléctricos en módulo 4, que tendrá lugar a la última semana de octubre. Uh, this is the only part I'm going to do in Spanish, so I don't know. The, the, hopefully the translation starts now also. Um, uh, happy to see later on also your questions in, in Spanish, no problem at all. Um, so welcome everybody. So we start with the uh, training session on charging infrastructure, the second day, uh, uh, the uh, module two, uh, the training program of Solution Plus. Uh, but before we continue, there are some guidelines from you for you on how to uh, to um, to manage the uh, the system. Um, you can see that all on the slide, but the most important is that you select the right language and that you uh, also mute the original original audio so that you don't hear the uh, audio uh, mixed so both uh, languages. So that's important. Um, and uh, further on, I think the slide is self-explanatory, so you can select the right, uh, the right audio. Um, yeah, first, a quick introduction, the introduction of myself. So my name is Harm Becken. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm managing partner of Jeff Mobility, Sustainable Mobility, and we are working on uh, assisting cities, countries, companies in that transition to electric mobility, sustainable mobility, zero emission mobility. Uh, and we do that also in Solution Plus. So we're one of the partners in Solution Plus uh, and responsible for the, the business models, the uh, mobility concepts, uh, and help, uh, happy to, to assist you in your transitions from this uh, EU-funded uh, project uh, Solution Plus. Um, yes, the, uh, the regional training. Yes, okay, we are going first into the program of the different blocks. The uh, first, maybe a little bit about the, uh, the different blocks of the training process. So what you see is um, yesterday we had uh, urban charging and uh, we had uh, EV charging and urban planning. Um, today we are talking about interoperability and charging standards. And then uh, tomorrow it will be about charging infrastructure provisions. You will see that has a very strong city perspective. So how do cities deploy charging who, how do they plan it and then charging solutions more technical and then an interactive session this is just some names of the program but there is a lot behind it and this is why this this training is not just a training to learn you the the, the bits and bytes the, the content about charging but it's really about helping you assisting you as cities as, as uh, national governments as companies on planning and re realizing a future-proof charging infrastructure. Uh, so we first start with the holistic planning, national level. Then we start, why, why do you have, do you need an interoperable system? Why not just putting charges everywhere and let the market decide? We will go more in detail today about this. But also, what's the city? How do you build concessions? How do you trigger the market to act in your system? How do you, uh, in your city? How do you take care that you, service the city, the future and uh, electric vehicles, buses, cars, um, electric motorcycles, scooters, whatever. Um, the whole system, uh, as long as it's zero emission mobility. And and, and then the, uh, the, this is about the, the, in the four, we're going more into how, what does it take to, to attract companies with, with good business models, for example, how do you make them successful? And then in the end, the the, uh, the interactive session to uh, and to bring all those elements together and to have a lively discussion. After this, we will work also towards a partnership between European uh, companies, uh, governments, and institutions with an um, uh, organization in Latin America, so uh, both uh, private companies as, uh, as uh, public authorities to uh, assist you in realizing this charging infrastructure planning strategy policy for the upcoming years. Um, yes, so 
we will start now with the uh, with the uh, the part on uh, the the modular uh, uh, to the, the, the unit two the uh, start the Stasius standards but it's really about interoperability it's about regulation it's about uh, standards also uh, but standards is very narrow so it's much more but before I dive into this just a quick uh, remark the training is a joint uh, activity of the uh, the uh, Solution Plus, so the EU-funded uh, pro uh, project uh, Solution Plus, but also together very much hand in hand with the GF7 program, UNEP, and also a number of partners that you can see uh, below the slide, like uh, TUMI, uh, C40 Cities, uh, you can see them, uh, the names uh, at this uh, slide. Um, yeah, going to the, uh, uh, the, to the introduction of, the, uh, of today. If we uh, if we look at the uh, the the blocks uh, of today, we we uh, we start with first with ALAT, and let me explain a little a little bit about this. So ALAT, the organization, the uh, the 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 partnership between the different uh, uh, the DSOs, the grid operators in the Netherlands, who together joined forces already many years ago, I believe, in 2009. To and uh, start to kickstart the uh, the realization of charging infrastructure, to also to kickstart the market, and they're working since that time European wide, worldwide, in creating standards, not for their own benefit, but just for benefit of you, me, the ultimate users of this system. Or uh, if it's for buses, if it's for cars, it's about uh, standards in communication, in communication in the whole chain towards the energy providers. And, and uh, Ayn Vargas, I believe he has been there from the beginning, so he can tell us a lot about this. Then the European Commission, Saki Garasis will be the next one speaking uh, from Digimove, uh, policy and data officer, and the man behind a breakthrough uh, regulation that has um, been uh, and, um, and uh, has been spread around, around the countries, and then the discussion now for the final implementation is taking place, or it's very, very close to being implemented for the, the charging infrastructure, the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation, I, I should say. But of course, today we dive only into the charging side. Why the European Commission? Also because charging, of course, is a market. But if you leave it all to the market, you will see it's going to be a nightmare for the users. And believe us, we have seen this in Europe. We have gone to all the pitfalls and to all the mistakes. And uh, Saki will uh, explain why they are making this regulation and why they're, they're focusing completely on the user, on the end user, either if it's commercial users, uh, heavy duty vehicle users, private users, uh, private car users. Then we will have time for uh, preguntas y requestas, so questions and answers. And um, 15 minutes. And uh, after this, we dive into the world of fast charging. So, Mech uh, Mechtild Maria Moore, hope I pronounced it right, Mechtild, will and uh, 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 this they will discuss the and present the needs of fast charging standards, uh, and also to show how they have been quite successful in making the CCS2 standard. That's also the standard for Latin America. To make that uh, applicable over the over in, the, uh, over the, in Europe, but also so worldwide, so that it really is the standard. So that if you buy a, a vehicle, that you are sure sure that you also on the highway can uh, charge that vehicle. Uh, and it looks all logical, but just going back to the first years, it was very difficult to see all those different different standards from Japan, from China, for the different ones from Europe. And I believe Mechtel, you're now working on the next standard for megawatt charging that's also largely adopted, uh, becoming adopted. Uh, but also there, it's not only about, uh, about, uh, about the plug, uh, but it's also about the, uh, the ISO, the communication between the, the, uh, the vehicle and the uh, charger, so the technical. Mechtel can tell more about it. And then uh, later on, we will get a uh, perspective from uh, Latin America by Juan Pablo Benitez of the UNEP program and regional, regional coordinator of uh, for mobility. Yes, and then we are by the end of the program, we have questions and answers again, um, and then we are somewhere between quarter to five and five. Please, if you have questions, please also, if you want to send them in Spanish, please do. Don't hesitate, 
just ask the questions. You know, this is a partly a train. This is a training. It's also an, uh, a knowledge transfer where together we will look at what can we do afterwards. But it's an important, very important also as a training program. And we want to have your interaction. So please interact. Please come with questions. And uh, don't sit behind the monitor and doing something else, please, because we cannot see that. So please interact. It's important for us and also for you. Um, Yes, uh, I think that's for now. I would like to uh, give the floor to Arjen. If I, yes, don't forget anything. No, I think that's the main things for now is the is introduction. Arjen, you have 15 minutes. All right, my 15 minutes will start now. Oh, I, I, and I see here, do you see my screen already or not? No, not yet. All right. I see you in a very nice room with uh, trees behind you. Yeah, yeah. trees. I'm sitting in the in Nexus office. Um, so let me start from the beginning. I guess it's okay now. This is the, the starting uh, uh, um, uh, sheet. Um, I'm with Elad, and this talk is about interoperability protocols, uh, standards. Uh, as Harm already mentioned, um, we developed uh, some standard, co developing some standards and are also testing uh, the implementation of different uh, protocols to see if we really have reached a state of interoperability where different devices can um, uh, can interact and talk with each other. My name is Arjan Warges and I work for, um, uh, for ELAD. And ELAD is an organization developed by the Dutch grid operators, DSOs, to kickstart e-mobility. In 2009 already to first uh, make sure that we uh, take care of one part of the chicken and egg problem so installing infrastructure um, and at the same time assess the impact of immobility on the uh, on the grid which is um, yeah, quite interesting um, doing that we also um, developed slowly quite an um, uh, yeah, focus on open innovation and especially open protocols. So we were established in 2009, we are now in 2022, and we have um, now opened a new test lab uh, where we still uh, co-develop some, um, uh, some standards, but we also um, do testing on interoperability, on smart charging, cyber security, and, um, uh, and power quality. Um, and that is why we went to this new uh, this new premises. Um, so with these projections, these are the projections of um, EVs and um, uh, needed charging stations. Um, with only this hardware, we are not there yet. We want this. We want these charging stations to be able to interact with other systems, um, and therefore we need interoperability. So this is not the Nicest, nicest sheet of the deck, but this what's here is more or less the, the core of, of the importance of interoperability. Uh, what it does, it enables communication between two devices, between a charging station and an EV, between a charging station and the backend, between a charging station and an, uh, a charging cart. All these between charging stations and the grid in a later phase. All these things must be in place um, to make sure that the charging station, the EV, all the systems do what they are intended to do and to make sure that they are um, able to receive signals and to act on these signals in, um, in the way um, we want the charging station or the EV to react on the signal. Um, what we also add is that interoperability uh, and open standards are also uh, royalty free. So in this way, um, different charging stations and different backends can communicate uh, in a plug and play way with each other. Um, there's a slight difference between de facto standards and the dual standards, but in fact, it comes down to, to have one standard, one interface description, one protocol between the interfaces um, on the interfaces between the devices. Um, and 
in the Netherlands, we have now at this moment in time, a very mature um, interoperable system uh, in terms of uh, roaming, um, in terms of station vehicle communication, um, station backend communication, but also what we are now focusing on in terms of development in the next years is the focus on development standards between the um, and charge infrastructure and, uh, and the grid sit and the grid system, so to speak, and not only the grid systems, but also other stakeholders in the energy system, which are more and more in the need of flexibility the coming years. But that's another presentation. Um, these things, interoperability goals and interfaces differ a little bit um, regarding on which terrain you are active, on which terrain the charging station is uh, uh, is implemented. The, so that, that's an important remark uh, that not everything can be copied from one terrain to the other terrain. Um, when we look at the overview of the most common roles in the um, energy system, uh, in the e-mobility system, there are three main interfaces. I want to dive in a little bit more deeper in the next uh, sheets. That's the um, interface between the car and the charging station, the charging station and the charging station operator or the charge point operator, and the interface between the immobility service provider and the charging station operator, the last one for, for roaming. Um, the the other faces the other interfaces I will um, I will do a later time, um, but at the bottom bottom right you see the interface between the DSO distribution system operator the grid operator and the charging station. Um, that is one item we have uh, all focus on in this uh, in this time frame. So um, why an interface between a car and a station um, to allow of course, all cars to be communicable, uh, commu be able to communicate with every charging station um, and to, in the end, um, decrease co cost and to provide charge point operators with freedom of choice. So they can choose their own station, sorry, hassle-free charging, sorry. Um, this overview of the different standards, that's more or less homework. You can read it. Uh, Afterwards, um, I will not dive into that too, too deeply. Um, this is an important one for ELAT. Um, this interface, um, we developed a protocol for this interface, the Open Charge Point Protocol. Um, and it was in 2009 already we were, when we were sketching, um, scoping the infrastructure uh, we wanted to deploy in the Netherlands. And we wanted an open protocol between a backend and a uh, charging point. That was one directive given by us, by our uh, distribution system operators. And when the word was out that we wanted to make it an open protocol, so um, everybody can use it, um, 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 connectable to different brands of stations and different brands of um, um, back end systems. Um, we, we got a lot of interest from other parties to, to join. And so we created from that point of view, a kind of de facto standardization organization, the Open Charge Alliance, to develop this OCP protocol further. And what it does is it enables competition, uh, innovation, um, new message sets, new uh, functionalities, and of course, it decreases cost, uh, it develops market growth, and it makes sure that there's no stranded assets. So when company could be bankrupt or um, then somebody else's back office can take over the charging station. When the charging station is broken or the manufacturer is bankrupt, then um, um, somebody else can uh, uh, take over um, the, the, the management of the station. Um, so this is what I talked about regarding OSPP. That's a very um, important aspect, but in this interface, uh, there are more initiatives going on. Uh, OCP is input static port, possibly on the IEC uh, 63110. Um, and that is also a interesting cooperation. Let's see how that goes between a de facto standardization 
de facto standard like OCP and the JUR standard. Um, more overviews if you want to uh, take a deeper look into different uh, standards or protocols in that uh, in that area. Um, the Open Charge Alliance, um, that's the one which was also founded by ELAD to have a separate organization, a separate group where the members can jointly together uh, develop OCP further and also do interoperability uh, tests. Um, when we look at this interface, um, a very important aspect, which I guess it started already also in 2009, where we sat on a table in, in, in the Netherlands to, um, to make a roaming work. So one thing we needed to do, of course, or that's something we did not need to do, is to do the plug standardization that was done in Europe um, within the, the Jewish standardization organizations uh, since then. Um, but we sat down um, to at least um, align on the technical aspect of the RFID card uh, and the reader, but also on the data stream behind it. So that every immobility service provider, every provider of a charging card, um, knows what charging card to provide and that this card is given at least technically access to every charging point. So it is still up to the EMSP, Immobility Service Provider and CPO to come to a business agreement, but technically wise, there is no um, um, problem uh, for, for um, accessing charging stations with, uh, with this card. And this is something um, this is something which is quite common in the in the in the Netherlands, uh, but it's still also a challenge um, in every in in other places in um, in Europe. But it's getting much much uh, much much better. And what it does also, yeah, it provides also charging location data, uh, life status data. Is it occupied? Is it not occupied? Is it um, in maintenance, um, it provides authorization data, so the discard data, and it provides billing information from the station to the charging station operator to the immobility service provider, so that the immobility service provider can can bill uh, at the end. Yeah, that's also part of the game. Can bill uh, uh, the customer. Um, yeah, and these these aspects. Uh, are very important to make the whole e-mobility system work. So, of course, we need hardware, we need the same kind of plug, but we also need uh, the same interfaces, the same language um, on these interfaces between, between the systems, between this, the station, the backend, uh, the e-mobility service provider, and also now in the next phase, at least from, from our perspective in the next phase, between um, the DSO and the charging infrastructure. Um, so, Harm, I don't know if we are, are we are a little bit on, on time? Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Right, right. Yeah, still, uh, yeah, you have still some five minutes to go. Ah, okay. But so, right. No, there are two minutes, two minutes, I would say, and then, uh, yeah. Okay, okay then, then I would like to say, um, um these these three uh, these three interfaces um are are the basics so when you um are thinking about deploying and rolling out infrastructure so really take into scope next to the hardware also these interfaces and make use of the existing open standards on my sheets um, and uh, via the websites also on the sheets to uh, further develop the whole immobility uh, immobility ecosystem, um, and if there are any additional questions, um, happy uh, happy to answer them. Um, this is also for free. Um, communication standards, but also uh, standards regarding uh, the hardware in the car or between the car and the station. Um, a lot of numbers, um, but this is really. And, uh, an important aspect.
Um, so this was this was my quick overview of about ten years' work, uh, Arm. Um, Fifteen minutes. Yes, uh, I am. Uh, thank you very much. The uh, uh, we have some questions and answers after uh, this next uh, presentation, and I will probably give you a hard time by asking some questions then about. Uh, why and what is the benefit of the market for the market that you did is uh, the, the standards, but I'm quite sure you will handle them, those questions uh, perfectly. So, uh, but yes, you can already no. prepare for that. Um, right. Yes, the uh, next uh, presentation is uh, Saki Girasis and, uh, and um, working for the European Commission, uh, DG Move. Um, uh, Mr. Diasis, Saki, you will uh, lead us uh, through uh, the, uh, the, 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 you will explain us the reason why uh, the European Commission found it important to step in. I think already in 2014 with the first uh, uh, the regulation or the directive and why, you, why it's important that you come up with a new regulation and what other regions like Latin American regions and countries can uh, can learn from this uh, why it was needed why we what kind of mistakes we made in the beginning in Europe maybe so happy to hear uh, from uh, from you. Thank you, Harm. Uh, good afternoon from Brussels. Buenos dias from 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 South America. I'm very very happy to be here with you today. And and from the Commission side, it's also very important also to. Uh, to share, explain, and convey also our learnings as part of the electromobility market, alternative fuels infrastructure, and also to share with, with you some of you that also are, are starting and, and, and abating a situation where we were some years ago. So, so this is a little bit our, our purpose uh, here today. So for that, I'm, I'm trying to share my, my screen so you will be able to, to see some, some few slides that uh, we bring for, for you here today. So to, to start so to start off, uh, as, as Harm was uh, introducing before, the idea in these 15 minutes is to present you a little bit what is the approach in the European Union by the European Commission in terms of legislation for alternative fuels infrastructure. And precisely today, of course, we will focus on, on electromobility. So uh, for that, and, and I have about uh, 20 slides, and, and I said uh, I, I would like to to, to talk about some some main pillars, some same concepts, and that hopefully you can you can bring uh, later on home and reflect on uh, besides uh, a little bit. And, and if we saw in the presentation before, because when we talk about the standardization and interoperability, there is a lot of standards, a lot of reference, a lot of numbers. So what is important for us here today is that you at least get the, the main concepts and then you are able to navigate later on a bit better these, these waters. So on, on that basis, uh, I like to, uh, starting a bit from the high level picture. So how the commission tackles this in a context of the carbonization of transport and how uh, through a series of uh, strategies and implementation programs, we arrived to a, a commission proposal on alternative fuels infrastructure. That is a little bit our, our uh, guiding book uh, to, to the implementation of, of standards and a series of provisions for interoperability in the context of electromobility. So on, on that basis, and, and, and in these 15 mi minutes uh, now, I, I like to start a set. Uh, where do we, we come from and where do we go? So all this starts uh, um, in 2014 with a, a directive from the European Commission at that time regulating for the first time the development of alternative fuels infrastructure in Europe that it does not only include electromobility, but also other fu fuels like hydrogen, natural gas, etc. But however, uh, from 2020 and with the new commission, Commission von der Leyen, the system commissioner in, in place, uh, a new series of objectives and targets were, were placed in order to ensure that by 2050, the European Commission, the European Union, uh, achieves a reduction target of 90% of, of uh, greenhouse uh, emissions uh, related to transport. So to execute that in 2050, also uh, uh, several steps has been implemented in the last couple of years. For example, that by 2030, 50-55% of these reductions uh, should, should be uh, reached and for example more new proposals like the uh, like the stop of selling of combustion engines in, in 2035 also to target and give a push uh, to the market in, in that direction. So 
starting for the European Green Deal and a sustainable and smart mobility strategy. Afterwards, we have uh, uh, the proposal that uh, in last year, in 2021, the Commission released so-called Fit for 55 package that guides uh, this process in detail. So what are we talking about exactly? So three main pillars. Uh, on the first side, sustainable mobility. So a series of measures and provisions to ensure the decarbonization and reduction of, of this 90% of emissions on, on transport. And importantly, also we talk about digital, so a smart mobility. We need to ensure that infrastructure, electric vehicles are digitally connected, that are digitally prepared uh, from, from the moment they are born. So this implies also a series of, of provisions at infrastructure level, vehicle level, to ensure a seamless multimodal transport. And this is much related, of course, with data. We also, as we will see later, we are working a lot on concrete provisions for infrastructure operators, also for vehicle manufacturers on, on how this data should be shared and how users at the end uh, can have control on this data and can benefit from better services on, on that, of course, on a competitive market for all industry players. And, and we believe that if we achieve point one and two, we are on the path also to have a more resilient uh, mobility and transport system that fits better the, the, the needs of, of users, but also of industry operators and, and also government. So this is a little bit the, the three main pillars we are we are based on. And what is important also to understand and what we try to convey from the European Union, and, and this is also a message that you can see with the, the, uh, the let's call the popular um, provision on, on, on stopping the sale of combustion engines in 2035 that other regions, like for example, California, they are following now, is that we are in a part of a irreversible shift. So this is a bit of a change of paradigm technologically in, in transport where we are moving towards a new technological solutions that of course, it, not just in terms of decarbonization, but also in terms of advancement, it brings much more value. So this is a, a new technological revolution in, in which we are in the midst of. So this is important also to, to convey and to, to explain from, from the Euro European Commission uh, approach. So on that basis, uh, when we talk about the strategy to, to implement this, uh, and, and I can refer to you to this uh, sustainable and smart mobility strategy there are, where you will be able to find a series of flagship areas with concrete key milestones that are the ones that guide our job, our policy job, and also guide the industry in, in how we can achieve that with concrete intermediate uh, milestones. So um, you can find, of course, this on, on, on the internet, in the European Commission and Mobility and Transport website. And, and this is also a bit uh, also for you to have uh, into account. Now, without entering too much into detail, when I was mentioning milestone, we have a long battery of them. Perhaps to share with you a couple of numbers that Afterwards, you could reflect on and, and some of you in some Latin countries and, and the region, you got a bit extrapolate what it would mean for you in that region. So when, when in the commission we talk about 2030, 2035, and, and we are talking about thinking of 30 million zero emission cars and around 80,000 zero emission trucks in operation, for which around 3 million recharging points would be needed. Uh, we, this is the objective we are working. Uh, I mean, despite all the current geopolitical issues like the COVID pandemic, the, the war in Ukraine, we are seeing an exponential growth in both uh, the number of recharging points, but also on, on vehicle sales. sales and, and, and we are still confident that we can, we can achieve and, and even we will exceed that, that target. Also looking towards uh, 2050, I said, the, the objective is clearly nearly all cars, vans, buses, trucks will be uh, zero emission. And we are also on the projections and current evolution, despite all the uh, geopolitical uh, sides, we, we are still confident and, and we think that we are on track on, on this one. And, and just to complement and what I'd like to, to explain now a bit more in detail, uh, to execute that as part of this strategy from the European Commission, we have put in place a, a large series of, of proposals for, for regulations, directives, etc., as part of the, the so-called Fit for 55 package that you can see in the screen. And of course, this uh, tackle all the different areas of the transport system. Today, I would like to talk to you about the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulation that was previously this directive in 2014 that last year we have uh, proposed, presented a new proposal. But of course, this is accompanied by, by as you can see in the screen, different measures, some that are, have been instrumental, like CO2 standards, by which progressively has pushed the market to 
to to to phase out combustion engines and move towards a um, cleaner uh, transport and, and combustion engine in this case a new combustion or on motor metaset uh, solutions but as i said it's also important to have in place batteries we need sustainable batteries and uh, escalate the, the production that at least in europe right now is not sufficient so also working on that strongly with the different alliances and for example in latin 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 america we see a lot of potential so it's important also to coordinate that that front, but also many other topics we were talking before, also in relation to to connected and automated vehicles, digitalization, cross border payments, etc. So this is a little bit our our vision, and perhaps moving moving ahead and looking to the time, what I like to to convey to you is our proposal on the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation, that is basically the key legislative piece that regulates the the operation and the functioning of electromobility in Europe. And as harm was very well saying at the beginning, what we have learned is that uh, and supporting a, a full market operation, uh, we have seen as part of the revision that there are certain aspects that the market alone has not been able to successfully address from a user perspective. So that's why the, the this regulation comes in, into place in order to steer and push this, this direction. And here there are two, three main topics to, to understand. Uh, the first one is to ensure, first of all, the deployment of charging infrastructure, so there is sufficient number of, of infrastructure. And on the other side, there are two, one, two, three other elements that relate overall to ensure a fully interoperable and user-friendly infrastructure. And what does it mean that? That means that we need to have uh, proper standards, proper technical specifications, uh, adequate uh, data that is also part of overall data space uh, architecture that allows uh, on the one side, uh, services to create new products that at the end of the day, users can benefit from. So this is a little bit the, the context of AFIR. This is our conception. And these are the concrete the concrete provisions you can see inside that le legislation uh, revolve around these, these three, four concepts. So moving on and starting with the deployment on, on, on charging infrastructure, you can see in the screen a little bit our, our approach. I'm not going to enter the, too much into the, the different numbers, but to give you an idea the uh, what has been our approach that I think is very important you also are aware on, on, on Latin America is a little bit that we understand that to ensure a sufficient tra charging infrastructure, we need a combination of both. On the one side, distance-based targets, namely to ensure that from an X uh, number of kilometers, there is at least uh, sufficient recharging infrastructure with a uh, sufficient number of recharging points. And on the other side, we also need that this needs to be accompanied by a series of fleet-based targets because as you all know, and for example, in, in Europe, we have different geographies with different density of population. So we need to ensure that where there are more, more uh, flows of traffic, there should be also more infrastructure. So this is a little bit our combination that is extrapolated also for, for, for heavy duty vehicles and also for other fuels like hydrogen and, and natural gas. So as I said, without entering into the numbers, this has been discussed also by the co-legislator in the parliament and in the council. What is important for us is to share this approach because we find out is the most efficient and based on our analysis impact assessment. So we believe that could be also replicated and, and have into consideration in other regions. Now, what is uh, more important and to, to finalize uh, and, and give you the main message today, interoperability. So what do we mean with interoperability? Standards, yes. And we will take, we'll talk about that uh, now, but also important to consider other elements, for example, payment. Uh, we can have, for example, ad hoc payment by which uh, users may pay with bank cards as simply as they pay, for example, in vending machines, but also we need other solutions, like for example, e-roaming, by which a user with a contract-based solution can use multiple recharging stations having more flexibility. So for that to implement that, we need concrete requirements on the charging stations. If you recall before we were mentioning digitally connected infrastructure that is able to have internet connection, can share data, can share banking transactions, and also we need the standards to execute that. In a similar fashion, also smart uh, charging and vehicle to grid integration, we need the standards, we need the infrastructure to be able to do that. And this is also very important from the point of view of integration of renewable uh, energy sources and, and bringing the flexibility to the grid and, and to the user. So, 
also we have concrete provisions on that and also importantly concrete data provisions as we were explaining before to ensure that the market can create these services like for example booking services for the user by which if you are driving from point a to b in between you can book a recharging station so when you when you arrive there you have the certainty that this connector is going to be available for you and of course you know how much you're going to pay for that so for that we need of course concrete data provisions so so these services can be developed and offered to the to the user so on that basis to to support this and and also to complement a bit what it was presented in the presentation before from the commission we have adopted what is called a standardization request to the standardization organizations in order to develop these standards and we mean here uh, the jure standards that build already the fact standards or protocols developed by the market so what we are aiming for here is to consolidate in the market uh, all these series of, of protocols and, and standards in place we aim for simplification we aim for interoperability and to grow to grow this market so you can see in the slide we tackle not just electricity supplies and interoperability, but also hydrogen and, and also water one, because at the end of the day, you will also have uh, electric uh, inland and, and, and maritime solutions. So you also need uh, to integrate them. And interestingly, there are very similar concepts. For example, when you talk about vehicle to grid, we can also talk about uh, vessel to grid, because for example, we also learned that um, certain inland navigation or maritime uh, vessels have also a lot, a huge percent potential for grid integration for uh, purposes on, on port. So we are working a little bit on, on these fields. You can find in the link below the standardization request, so you could check later on in, in detail. And just to, to, to finalize, also in, in this picture, you can see several images. What is important for us to, to convey is that a standardization uh, should not be a barrier rather than a solution. We see that we need different technological solutions for different purposes. For example, uh, there is a urgent need to have uh, a connector to recharge uh, heavy duty vehicles. This is important and fundamental to, to ensure that uh, we have in place infrastructure for heavy duty vehicles to charge in the proper time. And, and this is also a very politically uh, urgent uh, issue. And I'm sure colleagues later on from Sharin will, will explain on that. We are fostering and triggering this work from the, from the commission side. But we also need other solutions like wireless charging, for example. We see a lot of potential and in some member states in Europe have already test and tried the solution, for example, for taxi lines, etc. Where, where this makes a lot of sense. Of course, it does not mean that we need wireless pads in all charging stations in Europe, but there are use cases that have a lot of potential. The similar happens with electric buses. We see that those buses that, uh, of course, are, are being employed and stop with a certain frequency in concrete areas, uh, catenary solutions or, or yeah, automated connected solutions uh, make a lot of sense and are already being implemented. And, we have adopted the relevant standards in legislation for that purpose. So overall, the message to convey is that we need a comprehensive approach. Standards are fundamental. You will be able now uh, to dip into the references and how the international standardization works. But uh, what is important is that we need a, a comprehensive uh, approach based on, on common uh, international recognized uh, standards. And yeah, so this is a little bit our approach. Uh, one of the reasons we are also here today, because from the European Commission, uh, we see ourselves and, and we aim to become the world's connectivity hub. So we are triggering and, and, and conveying this message to you also to avoid uh, a market that is distorted perhaps by other regions with other interests. So that's why we support international standards and an open and competitive market. And we are very happy to share this knowledge with you and, and get everyone on board. And, and just to conclude the last one, I'm, I'm sure our colleagues from FEAR and, and HAM and all have explained, you can also be, visit our European Alternative Falls Observatory, where we have relevant figures in terms of infrastructure deployment vehicles, where you can see a little bit the numbers. And, and I think it'd be important that you can also later on think of it and reflect in, in your countries how that uh, would be could be replicated and what that would mean for for you so also to give you some some idea on on this field um, and this is all so thank you very much for for your attention i'm happy to take up any any question later later on many thanks thank you uh, saki for this uh, excellent presentation and also thank you for showing it the uh, European Alternative Fuels Observatory slide in the, in the end. We are very, uh, very grateful, but also very proud that uh, 
that you selected as our companies some years ago to 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 manage this uh, this portal uh, on behalf of uh, of uh, of the European Commission. Um, yes, I first would like to uh, ask one opening question to Ian. And then I see we have uh, two other questions for Ian, and there are also several questions for Nasaki. But please uh, see uh, only uh, questions from a number of people. So I hope everybody is awake. So please uh, post your questions. Uh, like it's also a training, so I will make marks how many que uh, questions I get, so you get points for it. No, that's a joke. But please uh, submit questions, get into the discussion, uh, so that in the the things we cannot answer now, we will answer afterwards. We want your interaction and we want the cooperation. Um, Ayan, uh, you told a lot about all kinds of technical standards, so much that it's uh, dazzling for me, uh, uh, so many figures, uh, the technical, but a very, very good presentation. But if you look, if I take two examples, like situation in the, in the US in the beginning, where you had five charges next to each other, different brands, and as a user, you had needed the right batch from the right operator to be able to charge. Um, uh, and the other one, the uh, a charge point operator creating uh, a, charge, a charge point system and network and then the, of charges, um, uh, putting a lot of expenses on expenses on the on the grid upgrading uh, the society cost. How are your uh, standards, um, your interoperability standards, uh, communication, technical ones, how are you supporting to avoid these situations? Like we have seen in the early days of, uh, of, uh, of the charging infrastructure market development. I in silent, is still there? Yes, Ian. I think his, his connection was frozen. See when he comes back. Shall we uh, continue with the first uh, now with Saki? Because I think. Uh, Ari, you were doing the yeah, with the technicalities. I think uh, Ari is out for the moment, uh, so he will be coming uh, back. Um, Saki, also for you, there are a number of, of questions. Um, but let me first also for the for the audience um, just to highlight and then to do one kick off a question. So really, this is the this is a, a masterpiece of uh, of work. This uh, this regulation and it's really extremely important. Um, we saw in the past, uh, and still it's not a, it's not heaven, so it's still difficult with all the charges, but this regulation will change a lot. Where the user uh, was uh, didn't know what prices he was going to pay, he didn't know where the charger was, he didn't know uh, what specifications it had, uh, had would it work, did it not work. Uh, he might have he needed uh, specific contracts to charge, uh, and he might be locked in in the, in the, in the, in a uh, in a situation where he uh, he needed to uh, to follow. The, uh, the, uh, the, the contract that he had and uh, not being able to charge elsewhere. Um, just a, in a nutshell, uh, Saki, uh, how is your regulation, uh, your team's regulation, because it's, it's a teamwork, there's many, uh, many years of work in it. How, how is this regulation benefiting the end user? It's in a very short summary. Yeah, thank you, Harm. So in, in many things, how it benefits uh, the user, <clears throat> I mean, on, perhaps on the on the focus we are having today in terms of interoperability, uh, one of the of the first and main points, of course, is to bring clarity on prices and overall user information and characteristics of the infrastructure. So, for example, thinking on us as a user, when you go to a recharging point, a recharging infrastructure, what do you want to know? You want to know what is the price you are going to pay? How this price is related to the energy that you, you are consuming? But also you want to know what are the characteristics of this infrastructure, namely this recharging point counts with the type of connector that your car 
is 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 uh, having or is prepared for. You also want to know, for example, as we were commenting before, that you have the certainty that when you arrive to that recharging point, you will be able to use it, or you will have to wait perhaps 30 minutes until the car in front uh, we will we will uh, finish uh, its recharging process. So uh, these are a, a series of different elements that we want to. Uh, clarify and, and bring for the users because we think it's very important that everyone embraces electromobility. So we, choose, we see some type of users, and this is very, very of course legitimate that they they were expecting the same quality of services as they were used with with fossil fuel cars. So we think that electromobility, based on a digital conception, has a lot of advantages, but they were not exploited yet. So we hope that with these provisions, uh, operators also get on board and understand better these issues, and, and we can facilitate, and at the end, we can reproduce just even a better user experience and more digital, more inclusive than, than we have before. So we hope that this uh, regulation will help us to, to achieve that quickly. Uh, thank you. Um... Uh, there's some questions from the from the audience, um, and one I'm going to package in in uh, in um, in one question two questions. Um, the um, the question was, what kind of um, uh, connectors do Chinese manufacturers use in in, in Europe? Um, I, I also understand why the question comes from because uh, this is uh, difficult for several Latin American countries because sometimes they specify the the uh, the charger. I believe it was in Uruguay, and still it's uh, provided with a uh, proprietary and uh, Chinese uh, uh, plug uh, connector type. And the other one, how uh, how did you? Uh, come to the conclusion on standardization uh, of the different types of connectors. It's called the Shademo, CCS1, CCS2, a GBT. Um, so I think this is an important uh, combination of questions, especially for the Latin American market, very important, it's very actual you know, at this moment. Yes, absolutely. Han. This is a very, very opportune question also to, to convey to colleagues here in, in other regions, uh, because I think these are some of the natural problems that you have at the beginning of this technology and that hopefully if I'm allowed to say from the European Commission we have in Europe, I think cer certainly solved the discussion. I think we don't have any more this discussion, but good to recap how we have addressed it. So for everyone understanding, in since uh, 2014, the Alternative Wealth Infrastructure Directive had uh, taken a position by which it prescribed that all recharging uh, point operators in Europe, all charging point infrastructure, should um, install at least the CCS connector technology, so combo two, namely. Uh, so this was uh, also a bit of a change of paradigm because it ensured that all charging infrastructure in Europe uh, had to offer this connector. So the users and the operators, so car manufacturers knew that this connector was going to be available in, in all charging infrastructure in Europe. The commission took this decision because this is a standard carried out by international standardization organizations with the widely guarantees and support of, of its functionalities. And at the same time, of course, did not prevent that other standards, like for example, CHAdeMO or, or others that may appear that could be used. Now, what has been the result result of this not even 10 years after that practically all manufacturers in Europe including very big ones like Tesla for example have changed and adopted the combo the CCS technology in Europe which is a very good result because we have certainly closed this this issue so in our new proposal we continue this technological evolution we also are working closely with the megawatt charging system that is the high power recharging connector also for for trucks and that follows the same principles and technological uh, scope that the that the CCS and, and we foresee that when this standard is finalized and we are pushing for the finalization of this standardization that we can bring it to legislation so everyone has certainty that this standard can be used so now answering the very important question because we know that several Chinese or, or other region manufacturers may be landing or are landing now in Europe. So what the standard they should bring? I mean, we think that there is no even question on that. CCS is the solution. All charging point infrastructure is equipped with that. We do not prevent that operators or, or car manufacturers bring other connectors, but we believe that internationally standardization has achieved this role. And 
as we see in other technologies, like for example, mobile telecommunications, where even the commission has adopted some decisions to impose a concrete connector, we don't want to arrive, of course, to that sort of situation. And, and we believe that the market still here is being very successful. So this has been our our approach. I'm, I'm happy that in, in other regions, uh, you, you could also reflect on, on this and, and hopefully we can grow together on, on this. And then there is a, uh, another question that is um, the, uh, um, uh, how did you come to the definition? Uh, I think it's a little bit different than asked, the request that I asked here, but you can explain that for every 10 EVs, there has to be one uh, charger because we uh, calculated based on kilowatt and not the number, but the question is here, but uh, how did you came to the conclusion to do this uh, number of charges to uh, per, per vehicle? Um, and uh, the, there's also a calculation, next one, that the question is, would it mean that for 30 million EVs there needs to be 10 million charges? I think these two questions are also very much uh, the same and, and very much connected. Yeah, absolutely. So indeed, the first one also to separate what was the previous approach and the new approach. So indeed, in the directive of 2014, in an early market phase in Europe, indeed, it was provided as an indicative number that for every uh, 10 electric vehicles, a one recharging point should be available. On what was that base? At that time, I mean, the projections uh, pointed out to, to that direction that for for every 10 vehicles based on the time of recharging and based on the network density at that time, that one recharge could be sufficient. But we have seen that this has evolved a lot during the next 10 following years, particularly with the entry of higher power recharging stations that reduce uh, the time that electric vehicles in public space would have to be connected to recharge. So as a result uh, in our new regulation in, in the proposal of 2021 of last year, we have came out with a completely different methodology that is based on the energy consumption of the vehicle. So you can find now basically uh, a series of, of uh, fleet-based targets and distance-based targets calculated based on a uh, amount of energy stipulated for every electric vehicle, so pure electric vehicle, and every uh, plug-in hybrid uh, electric vehicle. And I mean, uh, without entering too much into details and just give you the main concepts, you can find, of course, in the impact assessment of these proposals on, on the internet, and we can provide the links if needed, the concrete technical development of how we, we achieve that. But what is important to know is that here there are different metrics that have been considered. The first one is the number of vehicles. So if we know that in Europe, typically we have around half of passenger electric vehicles for the amount of citizens we have. So based on these estimations and how we want to achieve a 90% reduction in 2050, you make a series of, of extrapolations, interpolations, and you arrive to the numbers you want in between. And based on that, of course, based on the energy that these cars are expected to consume, and based also on a series of combination of the length of the of the roads that you have in Europe and based on the uh, traffic flows that you have, depending on the urban areas and the type of vehicle, you combine and you apply a series of, of calculations You estimate a little bit that for every 80 kilometers or every 60 kilometers, you need, for example, at least 350 kilowatts that will help you to cover, for example, a traffic flow of 1,000 vehicles per day or whatever. So this is a little bit the rational we, we, we were measured that it aims to bring flexibility because we have regions in Europe, as you know, like Finland or, or Sweden that are longitudinal countries with, with lower density of population and, and for which, of course, it does not make sense to, to concentrate or, or to have a very uh, narrow density of, of recharging points. So this gave us a, as the, the, the approach. So I said, what is important to convey here, you, we encourage you to look at the impact assessment because there are like 15, 20 pages calculations with all the details and that at a technical level, you are invited to, to follow up that and, and perhaps to replicate or even to, to improve the, the methodological approach. Uh, thank you very much. I will go quickly to uh, to Ian, and then I have a final question, a short one, about your main recommendations uh, to the audience and to the uh, countries. Quickly, there are a number of questions not uh, not uh, uh, not uh, not answered now, or not uh, yeah, not quest, not, not not asked. Just uh, Francisco, your question about the uh, 
the uh, the uh, UNES standards and the uh, uh, for components. Maybe to explain a little bit more your question, I'm happy to come back to that uh, later on. Um, because I mean on board charging, or you mean the, the chargers. Then there is a question about V2G. And if it depends on the connector, um, uh, ALAT is working uh, together with us, uh, also funded by the European Commission, specific on a large V2G project, vehicle to grid project. Uh, and yeah, uh, and no, uh, every charger is able to do, every connector is able to do vehicle to grid, but the technical, the technical situation, uh, the technical installation behind it, so what's inside the charger, is very decisive and the protocols again. Because only having the plug the same is not enough. You need to be able to communicate throughout the system. So, but please, if you want to know more about this, post this question also. Uh, um, and there was a question about the uh, adaptation, uh, adaptability of the plugs with uh, with adapters. Um, I think also good to to post that to uh, to the organization, uh, to Rosa, to me, and we'll come back to that. Arjen, so the first question. Uh, did you hear that one that I when you were suddenly uh, uh, beginning when you lost connection? Did you? Yeah, no, I, I was hearing hearing the introduction of the question, but not the question itself. Um. Okay, okay. So uh, the two situations. I think you heard this one where you have the uh, the five different brands of CPOs, charge point operators in the U.S. standing the, the different charges at the road uh, at a location where you need it for each individual uh, batch to be able to charge. And the other one, the cost of the uh, the, in the, uh, the charger being installed or 10 chargers or whatever by a CPO, the, the grid uh, cost and the being, and, uh, be, being a load, I would say being uh, the, the responsibility of society. Um, how how is your uh, how you how the standards and the the uh, the, the communication technical standards uh, are going to avoid this situation? Yes, they they. Um... And, and I'm raising this point because this is in upcoming mark, uh, markets always an issue that the market and the charges are being it doesn't work. So you can charge it, but looking back when the next one is there and next the interoperability problem starts, and you've been working a lot on this. Yeah, we've been working a lot, a lot on that. Um, but I would say it's also it's not only a matter of protocols; it's also a matter of uh, mindset and cooperation. Uh, of course, all these CPOs are competitors, um, but you must be aware when you um, are aligning on protocols on interoperability, you you make the accessibility of your charging station bigger. So your uh, um, um, your, your rate, uh, the number of transactions is, is, is growing when you uh, align on a standard RFID card and, uh, and reader or other authentication methods. So when you allow customers from other EMSPs to charge uh, at your station, um, yeah, it, it will also um, accelerate the market. When you have um, when you have this situation that you have comfort that you can charge anywhere with your card, also the customers um, are trusting the infrastructure better and are more willing to buy an electric car because they know they can charge everywhere. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a good right English pronunciation, but when we said together in the beginning, 2009, 2010, we all wanted to make to make the pie bigger, as so to speak, to to, yeah, to make it possible for everyone to charge everywhere, and that was despite our differences and the fact that we are competitors in that uh, in the time frame. Um, yeah, but that's that's a very important aspect. Um, the other aspect: um, five chargers, five megawatt chargers. That is an enormous uh, amount of capacity, but it is needed for the 10T network for uh, logistics chargers. But this available, this needed power is not available um, every time of the day. So when you also have a connection, a standard connection between the charger um, and the grid, um, then DSO, at least the DSOs in the Netherlands are now working on non-firm capacity agreements um, so it will 
be able that, to provide the charge pod operator with enough capacity in a time frame he needs it. Um, um, it will be costly, but not that costly that it is um, as it as the CPO has uh, unlimited capacity um, every time. And to to communicate about this available cap capacity, also a standard communication between the CPO uh, and the grid is needed. Um, and there's also an aspect we are now working on. I think this uh, it was not completely in line with my question, but it doesn't matter. It aligns nicely with another uh, question from the audience, um, from uh, Philippe. Uh, what type of information do you collect from the charging infrastructure through the, uh, through the interoperability? And how do you analyze and use this information for um, as, as, as grid operator? As grid operator. Um, we are asked charge pod operators to provide anonymous data about uh, the usage uh, of the uh, of the charger and we don't actually look as a DSO at the consumed amount of energy but we are looking at the requested capacity and the time frame the capacity is requested uh, to extrapolate the um, needed capacity and as such the, the grid impact. Um, and that is something we use for our own uh, analysis to predict also on a low voltage grid, medium, high voltage, um, where to expect uh, new chargers, but also um, what the capacity demand uh, will be uh, to give us an indication in which areas uh, smart charging or grid extensions uh, are needed first. Yeah. Clear. Um, another question from Francisco. When, uh, Francisco Gonzalez. What is the load standard uh, and how do you define the load standard for public transport? I think it, uh, probably the standard load, the different translates from Spanish to, uh, to English uh, in your country. So I think that's an, the easy the one. Amount, the amount of yeah. power, you mean? Yes, yes, I think this yeah. is the question indeed. How much the uh, the power uh, and, uh, standard, if there is a standard, but you can answer yeah, that yeah. better than that. More or less, it, it comes down to um, 11 kilowatts, uh, 11 kilowatts per socket, three times but 60. Public transport. This public transport question, it's not for the oh. passenger cars. Oh, okay. Um, no. That, that, that depends if you're talking about opportunity charging or depot charging. Um, and and that, that's um, when you, that is something also as a public transport organization, you have to you have to plan. You don't have to sum up all the capacities of the different buses uh, when they are all night during the depot. You have to smartly think about um, um, how long the buses are there and how long, how long uh, they are have the time to charge when they leave the next morning. So in the, in the depot, the, the charging is happening around 50 kilowatts, and that's DC. And at opportunity charging, where you charge um, uh, when the bus is outside, then it's it, then it's about uh, 350. That, but it's, it's not a, it's not a regulation or such, but that that's. Um, yeah, what we see in practice. I think to, just to add to that, and then uh, it is really a matter of uh, the logistics planning, the, uh, the capacity planning of the local grid situation uh, combined. That's also what Ian is explaining. Uh, and it's anywhere between overnight 50 kilowatt charging uh, for buses to uh, 350, uh, 700, up to 3 uh, megawatt in future. Uh, so uh, it is a, it's a moving target. So in the need, Ian, like you say, there is no. There is no rule or regulation, but technology the technology is going very fast. So yeah. what else? There, sorry, but there you have also this interoperability challenge between your logistics planning, your depot energy management system, and your charging system. Um, yeah. In Germany, they have put some effort on having these three uh, angles connected, uh, but that's also an aspect to be worked on in the next years in the yeah. Netherlands. Two, uh, two final questions. One to Saki, one to Ayn. 
So I was um, uh, uh, two months in Latin America together with uh, Rosa, looking at the uh, local situation. Uh, were very helpful. Uh, I've met many of the, the the ones now in the training. So so happy also for your time. Um, and of course, uh, what you see, it's at the beginning. So there's maybe one percent EV sales. Uh, uh, in in uh, in countries like Uruguay, um, so very small sale. Uh, buses are quite picking up quickly, but everything is at the beginning. What would be uh, Saki your main recommendation for those governments? It's just a very short one, very brief. What's the main recommendation you have for the uh, for the countries in this early start where everything is new? Yeah, it's a, a good question, and perhaps there is no uh, a single recipe. But uh, what we believe that would be would be important. I mean, and the, the main issue we we had at the beginning it was the chicken and egg, and egg problem between charging infrastructure and electric vehicles. So I think that uh, every country so should on in first place place to create the correct incentives for both the deployment of charging infrastructure that is profitable for the operators and that meets the user's needs. And at the same time, the, these, these countries, these member states, they need to, of course, map, understand what are the current manufacturers uh, producing in their country or, and or coming to their, to, their, to their country, to their market, and how they can ensure that vehicles are available. And of course, available, we are talking about a reasonable price uh, to the users. And for that, of course, there is a lot of uh, financial mechanisms to uh, ensure that, at least in these early phases, the, the electric vehicles are uh, reasonable at a reasonable cost for the user. So I would say that these are the, the main two topics to, to look at and from what we talk today and we learn, let us not forget about the quality of the services and infrastructure. So if this triangulation between infrastructure, vehicle and quality is done correctly, I think that would be a good recipe to have a good dish on the table for them. Hi. Yeah, don't forget, two things. Um, 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 Data-based planning of infrastructure, um, adding adding to, to what Saki has said, um, and um, do not wait for the cars to come, uh, take some initiative. Um, and in this planning of the uh, rollout of infrastructure, um, take into account uh, interoperability, like uh, also was shown on the sheets from the uh, European Commission. Um, this is very important part you should start with it immediately from the beginning not try to add it um, to add it later uh, on the immobility e system but also between the immobility e system and the uh, energy system system yeah very good um thank you very much for your uh, for your explanations and uh, and, uh yeah um, we will come back to you both later on after the training. So now you are released. So uh, Magdot will be the, the, the next one uh, presenting. Um, so I know Saki, you have to, uh, to go, uh, you had a meeting afterwards. So uh, then, uh, but we will come back to you uh, a, a lot like uh, Sharin also in uh, direct cooperation with the Solution Plus uh, project and the European Commission, of course, funding uh, the Solution Plus project but also being a real uh, driver for change towards sustainability and already uh, confirmed that they are happy to, uh, to, to share their knowledge uh, with, uh, with the Latin American countries. Um, uh, Mechtold, you are going to, uh, to speak about uh, Sharin uh, and about your role to, uh, to, uh, to make the uh, fast charging uh, seamless. Um, uh, happy to to hear uh, to hear from you what you have to share with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the audience. And please, I have some more question from uh, <laughs> from the organizers. But don't speak too fast uh, because the uh, I think uh, for for us in English it's impossible to understand, but the translators cannot follow uh, uh, along. Yeah, thank you, Harm. Um, can yeah, you hear me? Can still, you see yeah. the screen? Yeah, Mechtel, you have uh, still 15 minutes. We are a little bit behind of time, but because we only have four speakers, we are still fine. Okay. 
Okay, no problem. And I will try to speak slowly. I think um, a lot of things have already been mentioned. And uh, thanks, um, uh, firstly, uh, for having us here. So I'm going uh, to speak on behalf of Charin, the uh, Charging Interface Initiative organization, a global organization. And I would like to give you just some, yeah, some insights uh, what uh, Charin is doing. So the general goal, CO2 neutral mobility, clean transportation, zero emission, all these terms express the objective of Charin to promote uh, CCS, the combined charging system for passenger cars and light vehicles, and MCS, the megawatt charging system for heavy duty vehicles as the global standard. So the, yeah, hopefully one and only, but as the predominant global standard. So they conducting institutions uh, foresee that by 2030, we will have about 40 to 60 million electric vehicles on the uh, roads here in Europe and that more than 20% of heavy duty vehicles will be um, electrified. So the founding members, they were aware that uh, harmonization is needed. And um, they um, started uh, with the association in 2015 and uh, mainly uh, took uh, care about uh, technical working groups. But before starting and looking into the working groups, what about the Charin vision? So Charin is a not-for-profit association promoting interoperability of global charging solutions for all types of vehicles and uh, defines requirements, technical requirements for the evolution of charging related standards and for the certification of CCS based charging products. The Alliance strongly promotes the adoption of charging standards, including but not limited to CCS, the combined charging system, MCS, the megawatt charging system, and all these based on the communication protocol ISO IEC 15118 and related standards. So together with all measures and services connected therewith. Charin undertakes activities in the different uh, regions of the world to promote charging of electric vehicles, as well as um, charging also in the aviation and marine sector now. So this is the extended scope. And we'll come back to that a little bit later, but Charin supports battery powered mobility and related technologies of all kinds. When they started, um, the main activity was really focused uh, on um, technical issues. Uh, there were a lot of technical issues, and that was the reason why Charin um, organized five different working groups, so technical working groups that we called the focus groups, and they concentrated on the main um, critical issues, I would say, to find um, solutions um, yeah, in a kind of joint effort. So members from the different companies um, along the value chain of charging came together. Experts work together in uh, these focus groups on charging connection. This is all plug related. Then charging infrastructure, grid integration, then uh, CT, which means conformance testing and IOP interoperability testing and uh, charging communication. So the communication protocols with which is the base of um, the basis of everything. If we have some hot topics, then uh, we uh, organize uh, task forces more on a short term basis, uh, limited in time, six months, one year, maybe. And these task forces are also open to non members. This is important uh, because non members might also have a certain issue and then decide later when it comes to the um, yeah, when it comes to pulling together technical requirements and to uh, come up with recommendations for a sort of standardization, then um, we limit uh, the participation to members. And this is how the task force PKI, so the, on the public key infrastructure, was uh, born uh, a task force on HPC, high power charging, and a task force on cybersecurity. And then we have also some special projects for instance, on plug-in charge in Europe, uh, this is a special feature which allows for seamless charging and payment. And um, this is a feature that can be offered based on ISO 15118. And uh, this was um, pushed forward by a special project and uh, the PKI 
uh, or the yeah the root CA was launched only last Friday. So this is the part of the technical working groups. The scope. The scope was to have the combined charging system, which allows for charging up to 450 kilowatt and a megawatt charging system, which came up later, only in 2018, which um, should be able to uh, allow for charging up to 4.5 megawatt. Um, in the current spec, we have defined only 3.75, but you see that um, the megawatt range can go beyond this uh, value. Then we have some added values. We call them also the extended functionality, so plug and charge. Then vehicle to grid and vehicle to home. So um, the possibility to um, send um, power back to, to households and uh, to overcome also peaks or high needs uh, in certain moments and uh, yeah, to have this bidirectional uh, possibility of charging. Uh, Charin is a worldwide, is a global association, and uh, the focus so far was uh, in Europe, North America, Asia. It was then extended to Middle East, and we will, or you will learn later, that we uh, have started to look uh, to South America only recently. The scope of application of the CCS and MCS covers all kinds of vehicles, from motorbikes, passenger cars, up to bus buses, trucks, so heavy duty char um, vehicles, and now also airplanes and uh, ships. What was the reason to um, develop this charging system and to uh, promote the standard? So um, the idea was to have one single system, one approach for AC and DC charging, both combined in one connector, which is unique. One only communication module for AC and DC charging, then a charging voltage up to 1000 volts and a current up to 500 ampere. And as said before, a charging power up to 450 kilowatt. Interoperability is one of the main um, main goals, the main objective, because it's really the key to success, interoperability between different brands of OEMs, different car brands and different um, charging station manufacturers to secure a smoothless um, customer experience while charging. And this by, conformance by, by the charging conformance test system. PLC, power line communication for charging and advanced services, a certified payment and accounting system with plug and charge, and a state of the art communication via home plug green PHY, which enables the integration of vehicle to home and vehicle to grid. One system for all. So the combined charging system is really the global cross industry and holistic solution. One system for all is system family, I would say, uh, to allow charging of all, for all kinds of vehicles. Interoperability by using ISO 15118 as the standard, and this also for additional features. Then of course, a comprehensive infrastructure, including high power charging stations, minimum going up to 250 kilowatt. Customer comfort features like plug and charge, automatic, uh, automated conductive and wireless charging, which are important in the future. Then enabling the environment for easy infrastructure construction and rollout. The creation of an open PKI ecosystem, enabling further plug and charge rollout, which creates more acceptance at the customer side. Intelligent load management, including the vehicle battery in the grid. Then the megawatt charging system MCS for commercial vehicles, which is also suitable for aviation and marine. And at the end, the vehicle to grid management V2G with reverse power transfer. So all these are objectives that we 
want or that we have already partly fulfilled with uh, CCS. So here you have an overview of the plugs. The CCS, this is the type one connector, CCS uh, connector type one based on ISO 15118 with a PLC, suitable for fast charging, for high power charging, and here the different plug for the megawatt charging system beyond two megawatt, but going up to 4.5 in the future. So one system for all, one plug family. Um, we have heard about uh, the Japanese uh, standard, CHAdeMO, which is um, not interoperable with the Chaoji. GBT, the Chinese standard is not interoperable with Chaoji, and they are based on an 11-bit CAN system. We don't know what about uh, megawatt charging. We don't have any information in this field, at least not reliable. So we see if we are looking at the different features and at the use cases, which are um, supported by the ISO 1511-8-20 edition, allow us to have and to enable all these use cases from DC to AC, uh, bi-directional charging, um, automatic connection devices, but smart charging functions. So you know that we have started with the um, edition one, dash 20 started to be, or to be put in place um, beginning of this year only, but you see that with our system CCS one and two, in Europe the plug, with MCS we can enable all these features. So ISO 1511 8-20 edition one adds additional features and charging methods. And for the very first time, the implementation of this ISO norm will serve all use cases to enable seamless introduction of electric vehicles. There are a lot of levels of grid integration, and uh, I'm not an electric uh, engineer, but uh, discussed this with my colleague yesterday. And uh, in fact, today we are at level three of the different levels of grid integration. But today it is not only important to look at the technical features that are already um, in place or that can be uh, realized. Um, but more important today is the political dialogue. And we heard that also before from, uh, from Saki, because the political dialogue is indispensable to set the right framework, helping implement standardization, setting up the necessary regulations to steer the market without over-regulating. And this framework leads to the right investments and thus creates also the ecosystem for different business models. And um, on the European level, the Charin office in Brussels also leverages this exchange um, and this is extremely important. So while at the beginning of Charin, uh, the association, the Alliance mainly concentrated on technical features, today we concentrate and we put a strong focus also on that political dialogue on, on the exchange on the consultancy and very often also on a new role as knowledge partner to help um, ministries, governments uh, make the right decisions. Let's briefly jump back to the megawatt charging system. So uh, what was the motivation to come up also with a megawatt charging system? It was started and kicked off in 2018 in North America by a small working group and they gathered because um, bus and truck manufacturers, but also fleet management companies wanted to develop a standardized, uh, standardized solution to charge heavy duty vehicles. And that time under the lead of Rustam Kocher from DTNA, the task force put together all technical requirements for MCS. And the outcome could be observed um, in the framework of EVS 35 in Oslo, where we launched uh, the uh, MCS plug. And the request was 
to charge large batteries, to charge um, between 200 and 600 kilowatt per hour batteries in, two, in 20 to 30 minutes with power levels beyond one megawatt. And at that time, there was no sufficient and no safe charging solution available. And um, yeah, this common development of a solution uh, should and will be adopted by all relevant players. So harmonization is important. And then, of course, if all players adopt the same standard, um, the uh, political decision makers will also invest in the right infrastructure. And the right infrastructure allows for um, yeah, for helping overcome uh, the range anxiety, which we had at the beginning, and also the charging anxiety. So more acceptance is the result of this kind of, um, of behavior. Here we have another overview again, so to see um, what uh, the Charin plug family uh, or the CCS and MCS plug family uh, um, is looking like. We have here the combo two um, plug type two, which is mainly used in Europe, the MCS and also the AC charging at the very beginning. And you see here the test that we did in, uh, in cooperation with NREL, the um, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in uh, Colorado. This is Rustam, head of uh, that uh, task force, um, MCS, who uh, tested for the first time uh, the MCS plug. The mission of Charin is to promote interoperability based on the combined charging system and based on the megawatt charging system as the global system and the global standard for charging electric vehicles of all kinds. So um, we understand our mission um, in different ways. First of all, to spread the word. This is also the reason why we are participating in conferences, uh, exhibitions, um, in roundtables, and of course, also by uh, communication over social media and uh, other channels broadening the tent by integrating more and more players along the value chain of charging to join our working groups, the focus groups, to bring in their expertise, to commonly, to joint, jointly work on, on projects like plug and charge or wir Laden, which is a German word, but this uh, is um, practically um, the complete customer journey uh, during charging to find out where we have gaps, where the um, the, the consumer would uh, potentially meet um, challenges and uh, how to sort them out. So this is the project Wir Kette Laden. So really by practical test, finding out uh, where uh, we still have uh, space for improvement. We have uh, liaisons and strategic partners, not only in Europe, but all over the world with whom we um, collaborate on common objectives. And then the third and very important uh, part of our activities is um, the uh, proof testing and the proof of concept by means of um, interoperability testing. We call them testival, testing festivals, where um, we organize a kind of speed dating with cars from the different OEMs, different brands and um, charger manufacturers. And then in a kind of round robin test, uh, the cars move on, the chargers stay in place and um, everybody tests against the uh, new partner to find out if there are gap bugs in the system, if there are um, challenges or problems with the communication um, and uh, they try to sort it out together. So this is an enormous, uh, enormously important uh, activity of Charin and the testables take place all over the world. We are currently preparing for the next one at Dumbler Trucks. It's also a, a heavy duty uh, vehicle test, um, test event. And uh, then also by end of October in Korea. Mechtel, how many yes. uh, slides do you still have? Because we are uh, now, I think, close to 20 minutes in the presentation. Um, 
Oh, we can just jump over. I can speed up, but I, I think I would <laughs> rather prefer to leave out something than um, uh, repeating too much. Yes, so, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Harm. Um, yeah, we have regional offices and uh, today, as I said, uh, 2015, we were founded by 12 founding members and uh, today we are close to 300 and we will start the new year with more than 300 members all over the world. This is important. Uh, you see a little bit where we are um, represented by coordination offices. Here's just a short uh, overview uh, how the uh, members are spread over the different uh, yeah, parts of the value chains, grid operators, um, charger manufacturers, OEM, CPOs, uh, and so on, and how we are spread and um, are represented also in the different regions of the world. Uh, most of the top brands, so 18 of the top brands, um, are represented in Charinen. I think this is an important um, information if it comes to decision making uh, in South America, because I think um, look at the cars that you see in the streets and if they go for CCS, I think the decision is already quite clear how to move forward um, to cover most of, uh, of um, the, uh, the offer and the, the manufacturers. Um, we are working around the globe. Very important is that we are started to look into LATAM and uh, we have made up um, a program, an ambassador's program. We have um, an, an ambassador in Spain who is the president of IDIVA, the Association for um, E-Mobility in Spain and Portugal, who linked us also to uh, Chile. And we had a first meeting um, with uh, representatives of the Chilean, uh, Chilean um, Ministry of Energy. Ministerio de Energia in Oslo and uh, we started um, a dialogue and uh, we will um, attend the Bio Bio Ener um, Energia Congress in uh, Concepcion in Chile end of uh, October and uh, the Charin Chairman Klaus Braclo together with our ambassador Adriano Moniz Bayo will go there and we are happy to meet uh, people, representatives uh, from the different institutions and, um, um, and uh, governmental uh, minister ministries um, on site. So if you would like to uh, meet with uh, our representatives at Concepcion, welcome to reach out to coordination at charin.global and we are happy to uh, facilitate uh, a personal meeting to look a little bit deeper into details. Yeah. yeah. And anyways, if you have further questions, technical questions um, or uh, need of uh, more information, just send us an email and we are happy to, to reply. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you, uh, Mayfield. Um, and, uh, maybe first to work uh, make it quickly uh, uh, Add is that uh, there were the questions in the uh, in the uh, audience about the uh, the difference between the Chinese standards and the uh, the, the GPT standard and CCS2. Um, I think it's important to uh, uh, to um, uh, to also take in mind, like uh, like uh, Michael just explained, Sharon is also your organization, like ELAT, so like many of the European organizations, memberships, where you can really also. Uh, work together, you can bring your input, you can be in the working groups. Uh, so to also uh, to also include your specific local regional uh, issues. There was also a, a question about uh, before about uh, asked to, uh, to, to Saki about the, uh, the, uh, the, the regulations and the standards uh, for fast charging for, uh, for, uh, for vehicles, for uh, heavy duty vehicles. This was in the presentation also uh, a different, a little, little bit different way uh, answered uh, by Mechtelt. You've seen the, inter, uh, uh, the integration the testing taking place uh, all over Europe, all over the world. Uh, so that charges uh, work. So uh, um, for Montevideo, uh, your questions before about why does this bus not work on another, uh, this, uh, this public bus, transport bus uh, not work on other char charges. This is from the, with the same standards. This is about the, intro, the integration uh, testing. That's extremely important. Uh, Testables, uh, indeed, uh, very relevant. Um, yeah. 
Yes, uh, Juan Pablo, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, please also like the question to the other speakers, stick to the 15 minutes. Uh, um, then we maybe have some, nah, we have some very small time, a short time for some of my questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Harm, and thank you to everyone that came before me because uh, all the presentations were a very good introduction to um, my presentation. So there are a couple of concepts that people touched before, which are key to my presentation. Um, I'm gonna switch to Spanish to have a little bit of a more of a represent regional representation of the language. Um, so um, for those of you listening in English, if you can um, use the interpretation services. Um, okay, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, buenos días. Eh, gracias por, por conectarse el día de hoy. Yo soy Juan Pablo Benítez miembro del, del programa Naciones Unidas para el Medio Ambiente y hoy vamos a hablar un poquito sobre eh, un reporte que estamos trabajando eh, desde Naciones Unidas eh, y que está en, en, en proceso de desarrollo pero que lo vamos a tener publicado pronto y, y bueno que nos gustaría compartir como, como un adelanto con, con, con la audiencia el día de hoy eh, Me avisan cuando me pueden confirmar. Harm, if you can confirm that my screen is sharing, please. Yes. Sí. Okay. Perfect. Gracias. Ok. Eh, entonces, la, la idea del reporte es hablar un poco del estado de la interoperabilidad en, en América Latina. Eh, hemos eh, mirado a, a 14 países de la región que son parte de un proyecto regional que venimos trabajando para entender un poco cómo estaba tanto la, la, la movilidad eléctrica, pero en sí la interoperabilidad. Y cuando hablamos de interoperabilidad, no solamente a nivel de hardware, sino justamente todos los temas que venían hablando hoy, de los protocolos de comunicación, eh, que, que son claves y, y, y elementales para avanzar de, de una forma exitosa con la movilidad eléctrica. Eh, entonces, como les mencionaba, hemos avanzado en este análisis, eh, a partir de eso tenemos una, una guía para la regulación de, de los elementos de la interoperabilidad. Entonces, en base al análisis que hicimos, hemos distinguido como di distintos casos, o distintos escenarios eh, de interoperabilidad y eso, eh, esos casos, esos escenarios que vamos a mirar hoy, eh, se, se caracterizan por el tipo de, de mercado eléctrico existente en el país que eh, justamente es eh, probablemente el elemento clave que derivan en, en, en distintos escenarios, digamos. Y finalmente tenemos una, una mesa de trabajo regional eh, que estamos trabajando con OLADE, así que la presentación que tenemos hoy eh, van a ver que tenemos a, a Euro, el logo de Euroclima y el logo de OLADE, ya que estamos haciendo este trabajo conjunto de diálogo regional eh, para hablar también de interoperabilidad a nivel de la región, eh, a nivel de, de países vecinos y no solamente a nivel nacional. Bueno, eh, para conversar un poco, iniciar la, 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 la presentación, cuando hablamos de interoperabilidad hablamos de los elementos de hardware, hablamos de los conectores y enchufes, pero así como veníamos hablando hoy, hablamos también de los protocolos de, de roaming o cómo vamos a, a, a transmitir la información desde los proveedores de, de, de carga de los puntos de carga con eh, los, los mobility service providers que son los, los MSP o los, los, justamente las plataformas que, que divulgan o, con, o pasan la información directamente al usuario y también ahí eh, cuando hablamos de roaming nos referimos específicamente a que si un usuario tiene un servicio de carga con un operador A que pueda utilizar el servicio de carga de un operador B sin mucha complicación y que existan entonces, como ven en la imagen, capaz un acuerdo bilateral entre el proveedor de, de carga y eh, la empresa, digamos, eh, de, el proveedor del servicio de movilidad o una, una plataforma de roaming que vincule a todas ¿verdad? esas distintas formas en las cuales se pueden articular. Entonces, eh, nada más para traer estos conceptos antes de avanzar con, con la presentación del día de hoy. Eh, y bueno, hemos distinguido hemos, en el trabajo que venimos realizando, que, que, que fue liderado por, por Roland Feguerda y, y Juan Camilo Ramírez, que son miembros de nuestro equipo, que, que creo importante destacar eh, sus nombres y, y darle el crédito. 
eh, hablamos un poco de, de distintas capas o distintos layers de eh, interoperabilidad. Entonces hablamos tanto a nivel de hardware, eh, entonces cómo, cómo se, se, se aseguramos una interoperabilidad a nivel de hardware, las conexiones entre, o, o comunicación entre hardware y software, luego los protocolos y modelos de datos para el intercambio de información relevante, ahí probablemente entra eh, todo el tema del OCPI, que hablamos con, con eh, tanto con, con Arhan como con Saki. Eh, después, más allá de, de toda esta parte un poco de, de hardware y software y protocolos de comunicación, también hablamos un poco de las definiciones claras y uniformes respecto a, a los servicios, ¿verdad? cuáles son, son eh, o, o cómo comunicamos a, a los usuarios eh, la navegación, la ubicación de los puntos de carga, los pagos, la medición, la disponibilidad de los servicios de carga en un momento versus otro, la transparencia de precios, la calidad del servicio. Entonces también tener, hablamos de interoperabilidad en cómo eh, se, se comparte y se, se divulga la información de los servicios a eh, entre todos los actores, pero principalmente cómo le llega eso al usuario. Y finalmente, los marcos normativos y de negocios que permiten la colaboración y el intercambio de información. Acá nos referimos a que haya una regulación uniforme, una estandarización de procesos de negocio y procedimientos contractuales definidos, y eh, que de cierta forma no se le beneficie a un actor solamente, sino que se facilite eh, un mercado saludable, eh, transparente que permita la libre competencia. Eh, y bueno, avanzando un poco con, con luego hacer esta, estas distintas definiciones de interoperabilidad o mirar un poco las capas de interoperabilidad, eh, miremos un poco a los mercados, que como mencioné, creemos que es un elemento clave a la hora de hablar de interoperabilidad y nos permite establecer distintos escenarios a nivel regional. Eh, entonces hablamos que hay mercados cerrados, de eléctricos cerrados, con esto nos referimos a que hay probablemente una sola entidad estatal, normalmente a nivel nacional, que se encarga de la, de la generación, de la distribución, de la transmisión y en algunos casos inclusive de la venta del, del, de la energía eléctrica. Eh, después tenemos sistemas subnacionales que también de cierta forma son cerrados, que es cuando eh, justamente pasa ya con países con un territorio más extenso en los cuales hay múltiples ya actores, a veces estatales, a veces privados, a veces una mezcla, muchas veces una, una mezcla de ambos, eh, pero que también sigue siendo cerrado dentro de esos subterritorios. Y finalmente un mercado abierto en el cual hay múltiples actores, eh, en su mayoría ya privados dentro de la cadena, lo cual eh, fuerza que haya ya una, o, o, o por la existencia de estos mercados abiertos, ya existen conversaciones de interoperabilidad existentes eh, eh, en, en, en los mercados ya totalmente abiertos. Eh, y bueno, los mercados cerrados necesitan interoperabilidad principalmente para los clientes, o sea, ya que, eh, no, lo que lo que se enfoca es cómo un usuario puede eh, de repente en un mercado subnacional y cerrado, por ejemplo, para hablar un caso concreto, que vive en una región y viaja a otra región en la cual hay otro otro mercado eléctrico, eh, cuando hablamos de, de movilidad eléctrica, que a pesar de que haya eh, eh, un mercado, eh, un, un protocolo, en, en, de, tanto de hardware como de software, en, en una región pueda utilizar eh, los servicios en otra región. Entonces, eh, hablamos de interoperabilidad y la necesidad de la interoperabilidad para facilitar la experiencia del usuario eh, en los mercados cerrados. Y bueno, lo que hemos mirado a nivel regional, y, y acá no están todos los países de la región, como les mencioné, tenemos solamente algunos, eh, lo que hemos mirado es cómo está el estado del mercado eléctrico y clasificar a los países en función a eso. Entonces vemos que hay eh, un gran grupo de países que, que tienen ese formato nacional y vertical, como Costa Rica, Honduras, México, eh, Paraguay y Uruguay. Eh, vemos en otros territorios ya un mercado subnacional y cerrado, en el cual ya hay muchos actores, eh, eh, de, de, dependiendo de la región y finalmente habrá algunos países donde sí tenemos un mercado abierto eh, en el cual hay múltiples actores eh, en algunos casos públicos y privados eh, a cargo de la, de la, de la distribución y esto, esto se distingue ¿verdad? cuando hablamos de, de, de estos mercados abiertos y de distintos actores puede ser que exista un solo actor capaz en, en la transmisión 
pero distintos actores en el retail, en la venta de la energía y en la generación de la energía. Eh, pero sí, siempre en la mayoría de los casos, por lo menos en uno de esos roles de la distribución, de la, de la, de la transmisión, de la generación, normalmente en todos los casos hay una presencia estatal importante, por lo menos en uno de esos roles. Eh, y bueno, siguiendo con eso, con, con lo que hemos mirado y lo que hemos visto, eh, cuando, cuando, cuando miramos a la región mismo que había como una similitud en eh, los mercados abiertos, y también eh, eh, cómo se consiguen los servicios de carga en función a, a los mercados abiertos y los mercados cerrados. Y eh, con esto me refiero a cómo se, a si se considera que parte del servicio de suministro de electricidad es o no un servicio separado de la, del suministro de electricidad. Entonces, eh, cuando el servicio de recarga se considera parte del servicio de energía eléctrica, eh, los, mercados, los agentes del mercado son idénticos a los del mercado abierto, a, a los del mercado energético abierto o cerrado. Cuando el servicio de carga de vehículos se considera un servicio independiente, se abre la puerta a la infraestructura de recarga como un mercado independiente, como de los negocios independientes y nuevos actores de otros sectores como el transporte. Y bueno, hicimos este análisis un poco para entender también cómo se ven los servicios de carga eh, a nivel regional. Y, y como verán, vemos que en varios países de la región todavía se ve al servicio de carga como parte de, 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 del rol del que suministra la energía. Entonces, por ende, esto dificulta un poco, genera un, un tema en el cual no permite que otros actores puedan vender la energía eléctrica al usuario para la carga. Entonces, queda bajo el rol probablemente de ese actor principal, sea eh, eh, público o privado. El, el que tiene en, la, en el caso privado si es que tiene una concesión y eh, en el caso sea la misma empresa pública que está a cargo de todos los, los distintos roles, entonces sigue siendo esa, esa empresa la que está a cargo de, de proveer la, la energía para el suministro como el caso de Uruguay, por ejemplo, en el cual UTE, que es la empresa eh, eh, que suministra, que también está a cargo de la, de la instalación de los cargadores para vehículos eléctricos eh, vemos otros países como el caso interesante de República Dominicana en el cual eh, Existe la ley que, que inhabilita que, a que otros actores vendan la energía de eléctrica eh, de manera, o sea, a terceros. Eh, entonces, y, y que solamente ese es un rol de, de, la, de la presa avalada por el Estado. Y en este caso, eh, de, de igual forma que ocurra eso, también hay una, un, no, no hay una normativa clara respecto a qué pasa si esto se vende como otro tipo de servicio. Entonces lo que vemos que pasa en República Dominicana es que hay varios actores del sector privado que han venido instalando puntos de carga, eh, pero lo venden no como un suministro de energía, sino como el uso, usufructo del espacio de estacionamiento, por ejemplo, y, y la tarifa va vinculada a ese servicio y no al servicio de carga. Entonces en ese vacío regulatorio va permitiendo que, 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 que ocurra esto. Y después tenemos los países en los cuales cuando decimos no existe a lo que nos referimos a que no hay una definición clara del Estado a cómo se define el suministro de energía para la, para la carga de vehículos eléctricos, si, si es o no eh, eh, parte del, 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 o un rol que, que debería ser cumplido por el propio, el, la, la entidad que suministra energía o no. Eh, y bueno, pasando un poco a, a, a los distintos escenarios que vemos bajo estas condicionantes, eh, vemos que en la región existen tres tipos de, de casos eh, y que de distintos países caen o están dentro de ellos. El primero es el mercado cerrado, en el cual el mercado eléctrico en sí es cerrado. Eh, hay actores definidos eh, por ya regulaciones o leyes que, que le dan donde competen el, la, 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 la distribución y la, la, la venta de energía eléctrica. Eh, entonces, en su mayoría de los casos suelen ser estatales, es un monopolio estatal. ¿Y cómo vemos en este caso la interoperabilidad para un caso de mercado cerrado? Eh, primero quiero destacar que para todos los casos creemos que el hardware tiene que ser regulado. O sea, sí se tiene que definir cuál va a ser el, el, el estándar, ¿verdad? si va a ser CCS, si va a ser SAEMO, si va a ser tipo 2. O sea, eso sí tiene que estar definido. Y a partir de eso sí vemos que dado las distintas, eh, los distintos esquemas en los cuales están concebidos los mercados eléctricos, eh, existen o no algún tipo de, de, de alternativa eh, respecto a los demás protocolos. 
Entonces vemos que sería necesario que en este caso haya un protocolo estándar de, de comunicación, ¿verdad? como el CPP. El caso del roaming, ya que hay solo un actor que vende la energía, probablemente sea un, un estándar de roaming propietario, pero no sea necesariamente algo abierto, eh, pero permite por lo menos que todo, o sea, cuando vemos la experiencia del usuario, que el usuario final eh, tiene ya clara la figura de que bueno, este método de pago me sirve para todos los puntos de carga, porque hay solamente un actor a cargo de eso. Tanto, entonces cuando hablamos es que tanto el... el el dueño del, del, o el proveedor del, 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 del charging point operator o el operador del, del punto de carga es el mismo que el MSP. Entonces hay solo ese actor. Entonces realmente el, 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 la dificultad que existiría con el roaming en este caso no existe. Eh, pero sí genera una pregunta en cómo capaz o, la, la, o los desafíos que vemos en, este, en, este, en, este, en estos casos o en estos escenarios es que al, al, no, no hay claridad sobre modelos de negocio la posibilidad de que el sector privado ingrese a ayudar a colocar más infraestructura de carga, entonces toda la responsabilidad queda para el Estado eh, que impulsa la innovación o cómo aseguramos que en el mercado en un mercado de monopolio pueda haber innovaciones y lo que nos preocupa también es la conectividad internacional eh, no sé si Harm tiene ahí un comentario Uh, Juan, the sound is lost. Are you waiting for me? To, but just uh, how many slides do you still have to go? It's gone. Connection is gone. He dropped out. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Juan, can you hear me now? No. And anybody from the, the uh, technical team, uh, Ari, can you step in? Because I cannot, uh, apparently there's something wrong with the connection once I switch on the camera. I was just wondering how long, how many slides are still to go. Uh, uh, sorry, Harm, I think we lost him. Oh, that's the reason. So it was not uh, okay. Um, yes. Uh, then hopefully, uh, then uh, Juan Pablo comes uh, comes back. Um, just to uh, and uh, to already uh, start to summarize because we have still an, uh, two minutes left, I believe. Yes, exactly two minutes left, and we have to close. There were quite some questions to uh, to Mechtel, uh, to Sharin. Um, we don't lose that. We will not lose those questions. It's a training. So the uh, the, uh, the UAE Mimu Patel Institute team will collect the questions and we will come back uh, to those. Also, we will probably uh, have it also uh, circulated in the team uh, because there's always different perspectives. Um, um, I was very uh, uh, I was also surprised to see many questions about the plugs. Also means that we should send uh, and the, the, the connectors, meaning that we still have together with all of you uh, and, and, um, to do a lot of work to see what is uh, behind these systems on the technical side, because the, the really the connectors are really only the outside of the what you see. There's much more behind it. Uh, Mechel has present, presented this very well in the presentation. Also, I and it is uh, very well. Um, I would like to to tomorrow the 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 uh, the, uh, the next block of the training will uh, will start, and um, you will see this very much about cities tomorrow. So the uh, sets the charging infrastructure provision, but you will see that the cities are in this block uh, in the in the leads. Uh, uh, but also the, there are some shifts. So uh, in the, because not all everybody was available the same day. So the Dutch NKL talking about how cities can be assisted in their concessions will unfortunately be on the Thursday because it didn't fit in the program and we had to switch something. So in fact, every day is very important for you to follow. What 
What I, I would like to, exp uh, and we'll come back to that on Friday also when I moderate, what I would like to highlight is that uh, there are multiple steps to be taken in the, uh, in the upcoming years. For you uh, in your market as governments, public authorities, city authorities, uh, private companies to develop the charging infrastructure. And because the transition to electric mobility is so important for, the, for our planet, um, we think that we should uh, and, uh, together um, uh, uh, work together to not make the early mover mistakes that were made in the Netherlands or in Europe. In the, I come from the Netherlands, so we were a little bit earlier than the other countries in this. But in general, in Europe, of course, was also uh, so we st the Europe started around 20, 2009, 2008. And all those beginner mistakes we should uh, we should avoid. So our main uh, target to after this training is to evaluate together with you, also with uh, with um, some selected uh, organizations important that do are working in this field. So the, the DSOs, the governments in the countries, and to bridge them to European organizations like you saw the ones today, like Sharin, so Elad, NKL will you you will see the day after tomorrow. Polis representing the cities. Uh, European Commission, some national governments to uh, speed up the, uh, the process and to make the right uh, choices. So please be there all days. Also, you need to do that 80% of the, 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 the course you have to follow for your certification. Uh, but it's not about certificates. That's for school. Uh, we, don't, we don't do this and you also not for certificates. We do this to, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to accelerate the energy transition and the, and the transition to uh, sustainable mobility. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, looking forward to see you all back on uh, Friday when I'm there. Tomorrow, my colleague uh, Edwin will present uh, and uh, yeah, good, uh, have fun with the trainings tomorrow and the day after. Thank you very much. Rosa, did I forget something? I don't think. Hi, Harm. I don't know if I have two minutes left to finish. I only have two more slides and it can be short. It's fine if people don't mind. If some might already need to go, then you will see that. So, and we will then close then after your second slide. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Harman. I apologize uh, to all the audience for um, the incident. Um, this happens sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yes. No worries. All right. If it's okay, I'm going to share my screen quick again. Um, Okay, so um, heading back, we're talking about the, the different um, cases of um, market in, in the region. Um, so then case two, um, and I'm gonna switch back to Spanish, I apologize for that. And in the market national and semi-abierto, what we saw is that there are some countries in which there are various factors at cargo of the de la generación, la distribución, etcétera, la transmisión de, del servicio energético y eh, que potencialmente justamente permiten a nivel eh, subnacional eh, están, eh, hay estos distintos actores. Entonces potencialmente eh, eh, vemos que en ciertas regiones eh, podría haber interoperabilidad asegurada, pero al pasar de una región a otra región eh, de, deberíamos ver la forma de tener un sistema de agregación, de información de agregación que, que permita justamente asegurar la interoperabilidad. Entonces, de vuelta, tiene que haber un hardware regulado, eh, no necesariamente internamente los protocolos eh, necesitan ser regulados, eh, eh, los servicios también, o sea, simplemente a nivel eh, subnacional se definen los parámetros, eh, pero digamos como un todo no está regulado a nivel nacional. Eh, y el marco empresarial parcialmente está regulado de acuerdo a las posesiones o los permisos que se dan a nivel, a nivel de territorio, pero genera una complejidad para el usuario, como mencionamos, cuando dentro de un mismo país eh, pasa de una región a otra en la cual hay distintos actores y justamente estos protocolos no estaban estandarizados. ¿verdad? Entonces, lo, lo ideal sería que sí haya un diálogo en cómo se asegura la interoperabilidad en estos mercados, eh, teniendo en vista el interés del usuario. Y bueno, también temas de, 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 de eficiencia, ¿verdad? Y finalmente el último caso, que es el mercado completamente abierto, eh, en la cual hay múltiples actores y justamente el propio mercado para poder funcionar de forma correcta va estimulando la generación de, 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 de protocolos, ¿verdad? Y, y se tienen que regular. Entonces vemos que en, en estos mercados 
eh, no existen tantos en, en, en la región, ¿verdad? Pero sí vemos en, en otras regiones eh, que sí se definen los protocolos, eh, también se regulan lo, 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 los servicios de cierta forma, se definen métodos de pago, precio, unidades de tarifa, roaming, y el marco empresarial está regulado para asegurar justamente, como mencionamos, la, la libre competencia. ¿verdad? Entonces, para asegurar esto, tiene que haber una, una presencia fuerte del Estado estableciendo eh, las reglas del juego para el mercado. Y al mismo tiempo, como vemos también, en, en, como vimos en, 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 otras, eh, en otras industrias como telecomunicaciones, el riesgo potencialmente que existe es que sí vayan creándose como oligopolio o la posibilidad de que una cierta empresa eh, eh, domine el mercado eventualmente, ¿verdad? Entonces, bueno, aún más importante la necesidad de, de un marco normativo ahí para, para seguir manteniendo el interés que hablamos, que es la libre competencia y tener como interés final el, el beneficiario, el, o sea, el beneficio del usuario final y, y que el servicio sea, siga siendo accesible eh, con información transparente y, y sin ningún tipo de asimetría. Bueno, esta es un poco la, la, la recopilación de los casos que, que hemos hecho y tenemos eh, como una imagen de cómo los, los distintos países de la región eh, estarían dentro de cada uno de ellos eh, y adicionalmente a esto en nuestro reporte estamos enviando recomendaciones eh, esto va a estar publicado a inicios del 2023 tanto en inglés como en español y bueno vamos a estar divulgando en nuestros canales institucionales la, la publicación para que tengan acceso muchísimas gracias y nuevamente disculpas por, por el, el inconveniente well thank you very much for uh, your also last two, uh, two slides. Um, with uh, this last slide, you will finish the presentation. Send your questions uh, onward. You have the, uh, the email address, I assume, that will be can be collected via Maria uh, Rosa. Um, uh, but otherwise, you will get an email in the training package of where you need to send it. But please do, please continue the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the exchange of information. Yeah. So that the training also go, uh, continues after this uh, session. Thank you very much. See you all back uh, uh, tomorrow and uh, the next days. Thank you, Harmon. Thank you very much to all the audience.